What up, YouTube? It's your boy Joe with Meteoric Serpents coming back at you for episode number five of the Colubrid Corruption podcast. Tonight's guest, Jake Bratz from Longleaf Reptilia. What is up, everyone? I hope you're all doing well. Hope you're having a fantastic week. I am informing everyone uh, beforehand that this is a pre recorded episode because at the time this is going live, I will be driving home from the Orlando Repticon. So, Knew I couldn't do an episode, so I wanted to get something out to everyone. Uh, Want to keep the train rolling on this podcast. I've been really enjoying it, so I hope you guys are too. So, uh, yeah, let's get right into it. Um, typical stuff I usually tell all you guys. Uh, as usual, I have Meteoric Serpent shirts. If anyone is interested, please feel free to send me a DM. Obviously, all my social medias are right down here, so feel free to give me a follow on any of those platforms. Make sure on this podcast you're hitting that subscribe button. Uh, leave a like, drop a comment, do whatever you want to do. Um, if you have any feedback, any suggestions about the show, uh, any potential guests I could bring on, I'd appreciate that as well. Um, but definitely let me know how you're liking the show, guys, because, again, episode five still kind of new, but I've been really liking it, and the people I've been bringing on have been all awesome so far. Um. Then obviously, you know, with those links down there, the morph market, I have a few snakes available, uh, some Texas rat snakes for any of those keepers. Um, yeah, so that's that. And then next, uh, I've, I've been plugging it, but if anyone is interested in uh, diversifying their diet a little bit, this is not a sponsor of any kind, but I used Blake's Exotic Feeders. He's down here in South Florida if you're local. Um, or if you want them shipped to you, frozen thawed quail, been really great. I've been feeding one of my snakes a few times so far with them. And I'm super excited once my animals come out of brumation to really diversify that diet. Cause I know it's extremely important to, um, the health of these animals, you know, feeding them mice and rats all the time sometimes could not be beneficial and you could diversify a little bit and get them a little bit healthier without further ado. I do want to bring on our guest tonight, and I'm sorry, guys, we can't answer questions live, but hopefully I'll provide good enough topics for you all. Without further ado, please welcome Jake from Longleaf Reptilio. What's up, man? How's it going, bro? I'm doing well. Good, man. Glad to have you on. Thank you for coming. Yeah, I appreciate the, appreciate the invite, man. It's been a while since I've been on somebody else's podcast, so I'm, uh, I'm cool. excited. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, and you are uh, one of the hosts of the Herpetoculture podcast, so that's cool. Two yes, two podcasters on one stage, so that's always fun. <laughs> two people that could probably talk each other's heads off. So. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like I said, some people some people say I might talk a little too much. So uh. <laughs> I don't think it's ever talking too much if uh, the people are entertained and we're all learning stuff. So um, it's all going to be good. But uh, yeah, so obviously. Um, what I like to do with everyone. If you wouldn't mind, please giving me a little bit of background about yourself, about um, your business or what you do with the snakes, when that kind of started for you and, and all that, please. So I guess things started for me, you know, kind of similar to everybody else. I was the dinosaur nerd as a young child from wallpaper to bed set, you know, whole thing. I, I was all about it. And then um, I got my first introduction into snakes when I was probably about six or seven years old. Um, a local friend of mine, his dad uh, bred corn snakes like, you know, he, he caught corn snakes and king snakes here locally. And um, he had some successful clutches. So um, I, I got to hold some of his babies, you know, after they hatched. And I, from then on out, I was just enamored. Um but my father was one of those, uh, the only dead snakes, a good snake okay. kind of people. So selling him on letting me have a snake, especially at that young of an age, was very, very difficult. Um, my mom, on the other hand, was much more of an animal lover. It was my dad that really kind of okay. held back. Um, so to scratch that itch, my mom at about probably eight, nine years old, um, maybe nine or ten, uh, she actually got me some leopard geckos. Um, okay. Yeah, we had one, then we had two for a while. And um, those are fun. I really enjoyed the the leopard geckos. I kept those for years, man. Um, so that was, 
you know, long time of it. You know, that was really all I had was a leopard gecko for, you know, you know several years. And then um, I got a little older and I learned how to use the Internet. And um, funny thing about the Internet, there's a lot of information out there. Yes. So, <laughs> so I started researching all kinds of snakes from ball pythons to corn snakes to carpet pythons, any and everything I could find watching a bunch of collection videos. And essentially my thought process was if I annoy my dad enough, maybe <laughs> he will get me a snake. And after about a solid year of uh, annoyance, when I was, I think I was 13, 13 or 14, uh, they finally broke down and uh, basically told me to shut up and they got me a snake. Um, so first snake was a little corn snake um, that did not last long, unfortunately. It actually, it was probably three months later, ended up dying in my hands. And um, that really? was, yeah. It started like freaking out in the tank. Even to this day, I don't really know what happened. Uh, it started freaking out in the tank. I picked it up and it just it just died. And I was a wreck for three days, man. You know, I was you know maybe thirty. Yeah. And um, it was it was traumatized, dude. You know, because I had been wanting this thing for years on years. And um, so shortly after that, uh, they got me another one, a, a little baby ball python. And, um, I had that for years and, um, while I was in high school and living with my parents, I only had a few snakes. I think at the max I had five, maybe okay. four. I can't remember exactly. I had a couple, I ended up, my second snake actually was a hog nose. Um, that was the second snake I picked up when I had two, I got a male and eventually had a female. And then um, I kept it small through college. Um, I went to school here in uh, South Carolina and um, I kept it small. I think at the most, again, I had like five snakes. I had a pair of corns, pair of hogs, and a carpet python at one point. I, I finally got my first carpet and you know, we can get into that later. Yeah. And um, after college, I moved to Texas for, I was only there for about six months, but that was, I guess, around 20, yeah, I was 20 when I moved there. And okay. that's when things kind of started going a little nuts. Um, I was with somebody at the time who did not help the situation. Um, she was severely into geckos. And I was really into snakes. So next thing okay. I know, there was 20, 30, yeah, 20, 30 snakes, you know, 30, 40 geckos. And it was a whole thing. But at that point, it was kind of a menagerie of animals, kind of the whole Noah's Ark effect, you know, as everybody okay. goes through at one point or another. Um, some carpet python, some random colubrids, definitely carpet python oriented at the time. Yeah. And, um, then I ended up coming back to South Carolina six months later. You know, we all know how that goes. Um, and then, you know, it was just me kind of working this stuff. And I kind of started working. You know, things have changed a lot since then. You know, I was very carpet python oriented. Now I'm way more colubrid oriented. I think I moved back here in 2000, end of 2016. And then okay. into, I, I at the end of 2016 beginning of 2017 i moved back and uh from then on out man i mean i'm been working on everything you see behind me right now so awesome awesome um and you're still in south carolina now yeah i'm in the south okay. carolina low country so if you know where savannah georgia is i can be in savannah georgia in about 45 minutes okay so I, i'm gotcha. very 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 bottom of south carolina a town called beaufort okay awesome and then, so that was that was only a few years ago. So you're you're still pretty young. You're how old? I'm 27. 27. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I, can, I think I moved. I've been doing this now for. I've been into reptiles obviously my whole life. Been keeping some for about 13 years, but on yeah. a on a bigger scale in the last, you know, like I said, since about 2016, on a semi gotcha. large semi larger scale, you know. Okay. And then, yeah, so I was taking a scroll through your Instagram page because I like to try to do background information if I can and try to get a graph. So 
there was a period where your Instagram was purely carpets. Um, and then it suddenly, I, I saw you did like a logo change and then there's maybe been three carpet posts since that logo changed. So yeah. where has that kind of direction, like when and why did that direction shift? And do you still, I assume you still have at least a few carpets. Yeah. Um, but I see you really went full in with the colubrids. Like, why did that happen? So, I, the why is still it's it's almost unanswerable. You know, okay. I have, the biggest reason is you know I'm also an avid field herper, and um, so and we're gonna, we're going to talk about that later too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And uh, so I don't know, man. Carpets, carpets are really a beginning for me. You know, back when I was doing all the research on snakes, you know, to annoy my dad to let me get one. I was going through Reptiles TV. I don't know if anybody from back in the day remembers that. They only had a few videos, but they had one about a carpet python. And as soon as I saw the snake, I was like, oh, my God, like I have to have that one day, you know. So I did I did research immediately, you know, because I always had size requirements whenever we were thinking about snakes. And everything I read was carpet pythons get eight to ten feet long, all this crap. And um so I knew that was kind of out of the picture. Um, I got my first one when I was in college, but I never stopped thinking about them. You know, as soon as I was able to get one, um, then, you know, I, I did I did what I had to do. I think I, tra I traded two corn snakes and 40 bucks for my first carpet python. And it was All just, right. you know, some undocked. It was labeled an IJ, you know, back then. And then, you know, obviously now I know it was just an undocumented cross of some kind, um, which was fine. It was a great snake. You know, I had it for years. And, um, so I, after that, it was the all downhill as soon as I could get snakes that I wanted without having to ask anybody about it. It was balls to the wall, carpet pythons, uh, specifically pop wins or IJs, whatever you want to refer to them as. Okay. Um, so it, that's, it, I, that really took a hold of me. I had a few other things, some coastals. Um, uh, mainly IJs and I never really got the jungle bug. Um, it's just hasn't really been my thing. Not, nothing against them. I always liked stuff that was a little less in the limelight, you could say. Um, okay. so pop ones definitely filled that niche. They're a little bit on the smaller side, um, a little bit more manageable, you know? So that was really where I put my focus. And at one point I had, you know, a, a ton, a ton, a ton, ton of pop ones. Um, you know, I had the morphs, I had exantics, I had, you know, granites, um, all kinds of stuff I was raising up, tons of farm bred animals and all that. And that was the other thing that really drew me to pop ones was being able to get farm bred blood, you know, new, new blood into the States. Um, so that was really my main focus for a long time. And then one of the not so fun parts of this hobby is, you know, viruses, diseases, all that. Um, and this is one of the things not fun to talk about, but anybody who's listened to my podcast knows, um, at one point in time and most people have it, but at one point in time I had a serious case of nidovirus that was running through my collection and it wiped out a ton of my animals okay. really kind of brought me back down the not, I still had plenty, you know, that tested negative, I ended up testing everything, you know, several times. And um, anything I tested positive, I ended up, you know, euthanizing because I couldn't, I didn't have the space to keep, you know, a positive collection, unfortunately. And by that time, you know, the animals were showing serious signs and, you know, I'm not one to let, let those animals, you know, die slowly. So yeah. did the hard thing and I put a lot of my prized animals down. And um, once that was kind of all in the clear, I was in a very weird part in my life where i kind of was out of the hobby for about a year um i still kept snakes personally you know but i was in a situation i wasn't doing my podcast i wasn't posting i wasn't on social media at all for about uh -huh. a year and and uh, and listen i could you know i could see something like a virus ruining your ruining your collection like really being a damper on your your spirits yeah. to doing that. Like, I don't, I don't know what I would do if I lost half my animals tomorrow. Like I'd just be crushed beyond belief. Not that it would 
drive me out per se, but like I, I know I'd be very, very discouraged. So I can at least yeah. feel for you there. It was it was devastating, man. I lost more than half of what I had. Yeah. It was like I had I lost the first snake I ever bred. And that was crushing. I lost my first ever carpet python. And uh, you know, those those hits were just monumental man you know it, it had me being like do i even want to do this anymore you know it was soul crushing you know it took yeah. everything out of me and it wasn't because of that that you know i had to step away from the hobby for a while it was personal factors and things gotcha. and, you know that's all stuff we don't have to get into it's a bunch of a bunch of bs but um but during that time you know once things kind of cleared out i was just i was always on social media kind of just looking wasn't talking to anybody, wasn't on the podcast, you know, but I was always looking and um, I came across a guy named Chris Montross, who is now a very good friend of mine. He's been a mentor of mine for the last several years, honestly. Yeah. And, um, and I was good. I was going to ask about him because I followed him for mm -hmm. quite some time over Facebook and I saw that your collection model kind of followed what he does. So I, I was going to ask and I saw you had a couple snakes from him. So yeah, oh, I, yeah. I have more than a couple of snakes. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, he's been a huge mentor of mine the last several years, you know. Um, and he, he's a great dude. Very, very, very knowledgeable. One of the smartest guys I know knows so much about these animals. And uh, he's, a, he's a great dude. Um, so I found his page and I found these white oak i found apalachicola white oak gray rat snakes that he had available and i saw these and i was just like wow man you know I, I would really like to start keeping rat snakes you know because that's the most common thing i see around here you know is, is yep. you know yellow rat snakes that's what i grew up catching more of than anything else and um you know at the time he just had grays available so um i messaged him and managed to pull a few strings and, and i bought this this pair of white oaks and um it, i was just obsessed dude like these were just incredible little tiny fresh hatchlings um yep. it was the year the one year in daytona i haven't been in probably the last six or seven years the one time i have not gone um he brought them and justin picked them up for me and um and dude the minute i saw them it was like i i need more you know, I've got to, got to have more. And I yeah. dove really heavier into the locality thing, you know, from talking to Chris and looking through his collection. And, you know, because I've always been a wild type guy. Um, even when I had, you was strictly in carpet pythons, I eventually moved out every morph that I had to solely focus on wild type poplins and selectively breeding for colors, patterns, you know, all this stuff. It's always been kind of my my forte my cup of tea what you know what really excites me about the hobby it may not be flashy it may not be for everybody but it's what gets me going you know no it and yeah you actually beat me to a punch on a question i had because you know you have all these locality animals um as far as i could tell like do you do you really keep any morphs really mm -hmm. or is it mostly okay all right yeah. either way I, I like i was scrolling through your instagram and i could tell they're just you know either well line bred locales or, or something to that extent. So um, I think there's definitely something to be found in these locality animals and you could still work, you know, these phenotypic, you know, line bred traits on these animals to make some really awesome things um, without genetic mutations. And sometimes you could even do that with mutations as well. But uh, yeah, go, go on with them. Um, yeah. The so, yeah, no, no, you're good. Um, yeah, the, as far as like the morph thing goes, it's never really been my thing. But as of recent, I've kind of been on a kind of a mission to get all of the pure locality morphs. So kind of a mixture of the two, you know, it's not a bunch of combos or anything, but like okay. Amel, Glades County, Everglades Rat Snakes. I've got those uh, pure Gulf Hammock, Amels. I've got those now too. You know, stuff like that, you know, it's kind of a mix of mix of both, you know, just to, you know, offer a little, little something extra and right. you know, what I do. And the morphs are just beautiful. And the fact that they're pure locality, you know, down to the county is, is just amazing to me. Um, but yeah, so I got these gray rats and I was like, you know, I gotta, I gotta get more, man. You know, I just, I loved them. 
it was definitely a little bit of a shift from going from all carpet because at that time i had nothing but carpet pythons it was all carpets at that time it may have even been all pop winds maybe one pair of coastals uh, okay. so it was a little bit of a shift you know really small snakes really small meals but also need to be fed more frequently type of thing um so it was a little getting used to you know uh pop winds and carpets in general can go you know a bit longer without food you know and they don't need to because their metabolism isn't nearly as high um so it was a little bit of a shift but i i just i loved it man and um once i got out of my <laughs> bad situation and i was free you could say um i think the day after i bought a pair of yellow rats from a good buddy of mine that chris actually chris montrose produced them a really good buddy of mine had them he offered them to me and i bought them you know immediately I, you know there was okay. no doubt to it those were seminole county yellow rats i still have them you know, right here to my right they will be breeding next year um and everything just kind of started happening, man. You know, I got with Chris and I, I got with, I got, you know, all the localities, you know, I could get, you know, I got with my other buddy, Chris Painshab, which, you know, he's an amazing dude. If you want a really good, really good guy to be on here, Chris Painshab. He, he, he'll be on soon. Okay. Yeah. He'll be, he's, he'll be on soon. <laughs> he's become one of my best friends, man. I love that guy to death. He is just infectious in the hobby. He's, he's amazing. Um, so he, he's the one that really got me into pits, um, uh, Pituophis. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I got into locality Pituophis, locality Pantherophis, which those are my main thing, you know, specifically yellow rats. I think okay. now I counted yesterday, I'm up to 10, 10 different County specific localities of just yellows. Oh, and wow. Then I've got a inner, a wild caught intergrade. That's a gray and a yellow you know cross but it is a wild caught animal it's naturally occurring um cool. so that, i've only got one animal for that so i'm working on that project and then i think three or four localities of grays um locality uh golf hammocks and then you know random pitchy office and you know other things from there i've also got some hog nest snakes those are a little side project that's kind of my morph project is my hogs okay i've always, I've always had a soft spot for hog i recently got back into those nice uh, and with all that you know i still have uh carpet pythons i still do have you know my pop ones um i've got uh, i think three pairs right now two uh, an adult pair and then three other pairs coming up so i might have like four i might have it's either eight or ten i can't remember but um yeah i've got a few pairs of those that are coming up and uh hopefully producing those again this year but Awesome. Yeah. Cool. All right. So, um, yeah, North American locality rat snakes. I love the North American stuff. And obviously I keep Texas rats. So I have a soft spot, a soft spot for pantherophis in general. I've got um, a, I've got a really cool after this is over. I've got a really cool locality of Texas rat that is oh, really? some of the only ones in the States. There's like one guy that produces them. They're Morris County, Texas. And these things are like the adults are like black and they've got these red, really? red undertone scales on them. They're, they're really cool, man. I'll That's just, cool. I'll send you some pictures when we're, when All we're right. over this. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah. And I, I've really been interested in the locality stuff as well. Like I almost want to, and I barely see, I haven't gone like real deal herping, but like if I saw a wild corn, like there's a lot that's going to, it's going to take a lot for me to not pick it up off the ground and bring it home to have, you know, ho homegrown locality, uh, you know, Palm Beach County corn yeah. snake in my house. Yeah, um, man, you can't beat it. My, my podcast partner, Justin, he works with, so Beaufort County is made up of several islands, essentially. Okay. So we've got, you know, Ladies Island's probably the biggest one. A lot of people live out there. That's where Justin lives. His dad's got property and they've actually collected corns from there. And he's produced several pure Ladies Island locality, you know, corn snakes. And I've got a pair of those as well. And uh, awesome. it's really, it's really cool to have stuff from your, your home, 
you know, the town, you know, it's, yep. it's really neat. It's really fun. Yeah, definitely. And then, you know, just for the people, what's kind of like your husbandry looking like on most of these snakes? Just, I kind of want to get into all that, like just keeping, like what's your keeping style? Like, what do you do? What's going on in your house? Well, if you look by, if anybody's watching, you can almost look behind me and see the progression. So right here, I've got, oh, I can't point right. I've got my racks. So these are all black box, black box cages and racks uh, systems. And uh, they are amazing. I use those for younger snake, younger rat snakes and pituophis grow outs. Um, they start out in those usually just for, you know, safety sake. Um, if you've dealt with rat snakes, they're very they Babies especially can be very wiry, um, easily stressed. So I do use racks, but I do set my tubs up a little differently than a lot of people. Uh, most people kind of just put some bedding in there, a water dish hide at one end um i try to take it a little farther you know i normally try to put two hides in there a little bit bigger of a tub okay. and um i use this i use this fencing from lowe's or home depot it's like a wire fence and i cut it to create perches and all of my stuff from the tubs to these other tubs over here that you see behind me i use that stuff a lot and i use I, I create perching in all of my racks, you know, especially for the rat snakes, you know, something for them to get off the ground, you know, get a little bit. Interesting. And, um, you know, just to add different levels because most of your North American rat snakes are semi arboreal. So they will take advantage of using those, you know, as a way to get up off the ground. And a lot of times, and the, another reason I use it is because, you know, most of your rat snakes and carpet pythons alike, they don't sit when they perch, they don't sit like a green tree python. You know, they, they like several, several areas to lay across and this stuff works perfectly for them to just kind of lay flat across the entire thing yeah. and um, works really, really well. Takes up more than half of the tub, you know, that way they have just like that second layer to get up off the ground and it works really, really well. Um, I usually use, uh, I use a bigger water dish in them and then, um, once they outgrow, uh, what I think they should be out of a actual rack system they go into one of these tubs back here these are gasket locking tubs and um they they lock really really well nothing's ever getting out of them i melt a ton of holes in them um because i'm really big on ventilation i think yeah. ventilation is something as a whole the hobby lacks you know and you know i'm not calling out any person in particular or any any section of the hobby in particular but a lot of people just put you know a couple holes in it and say good to go my tubs are riddled with holes it takes me hours on end to do a set of tubs you know because of how many holes i will solder into it okay um but i i put a ton of ventilation in them and i use those tubs to just give them even more height more space you know all that stuff and then once they go from there they will either go into a three by two by two or three by two by 18 or a 110 quart tub, which I've got a stack you know, over here to the side. Um, Hefty or Lowe's makes a 100 to 110 quart tub that's got latches on all four sides. And okay. it's about the footprint of a V70, but it's 13 inches tall. So it's, cool. it's a really good size tub, works really well for smaller adult rat snakes. Um, even some of my some of my bigger ones, you know, I would like them to go in a three footer, um, but they fit perfectly in these one tens for now. And then once they outgrow that, if they do, because some of them will stay a little bit smaller, they really don't need to get out of that. You know, once they get out of there, they'll either go into a three by two by two, a three by two by 18 or a four by two by 18, depending on the snake and its activity and its size. Because some of your yellow rats, man, they're big, really, really big. Okay. I think yeah, my, I wanted. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. I think I was just gonna say I think my biggest yellow rat now, his name is Rico. He's a wild caught Hernando County animal and he's six, six and a half foot easily. Cool. You know, so he's a he's a big boy. Um, so they get they get they can get fairly large. So at that size, you want to get them in something a little bit a little bit bigger. Um, but yeah. Okay. And as you're talking about size, something that just came to my head that I'm curious about. Have you seen any sort of correlation 
that comes with size and locality where they're from. Now I know their their range is like generally like kind of specific, so there may not be like a huge swing. Like obviously it's between a few states, so it's not a huge amount of ground. But I'm curious to know if you've seen any significant size difference, maybe between bloodlines at all. Uh, in just yellows, not, not really. Um, okay. even most of the pantherophis from Everglades to black rats, um, they get relatively the same size. Um, it's really depends on the individual. The males do get a little bit bigger than the females from what I've noticed. Uh, yep. the males are normally pretty hefty animals. Um, but you know, in my experience, usually the gray rats will be a little bit smaller than yellows, you know, until they reach, you know, seriously older, you know, yellow rats get bigger quicker in my, in my opinion, you know, at that adult size, um, most of the gray rats, I, you know, you look at a, my adult male, Santa Rosa County, he's a good size animal, but he's not huge. You look at Rico, Rico's huge. You know, he's a okay. massive, massive yellow rat. And he's not overfed, you know, he gets a, he gets one chick every, I don't know, 10 days to two weeks, you know, okay. and you know, he's just, he's just a big boy, dude, you know? And yeah. So there's not the, as far as yellow rats are concerned though, no, there's not a ton of, uh, variants, um, in them, maybe in some, some of the more insular areas, you know, some of your Island localities might stay a little bit smaller. Um, gotcha. But, you know, it's not like because I know there's some corn snakes that stay smaller. You know, there's a I was. Yeah, I was going to say corns, corns, I would say, if anything, were the ones that stayed a little bit yeah. smaller. Like I always like my general rule of thumb, like corns were always like four to five feet. And then my Texas rats more like five to six, yeah. like max yeah. adult size. Yeah. And that's about that's about the same with most of your, you know, eastern pantherophis you know corn stay a little bit smaller and then there's even localities of corns like montrose works with a mountain locality um that i cannot remember off the top of my head um so it's the south mountains i can't remember exactly what state uh, north carolina i believe okay. and um they're a much much smaller locality like adults are like three foot type of oh wow yeah they're they're really small um whereas down here yeah you know i have found them probably pushing about four foot you know has been the biggest but your average is yeah your average is about four four and a half foot you know for a a bigger older adult animal uh but then yeah i've caught i've caught rat snakes here man i I caught one i grew up kind of in the boonies here and here in beaufort and uh, my neighbors had chickens and i was the snake guy and okay. um, they called me one day and they're like, there's, you know, there's, there's a snake in the chicken coop dude. And uh, I, back then I was, I'm not, I haven't grown a lot in the last, like, since like high school, you know, I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty short dude. Uh, I'm with you. I'm there too. <laughs> so, I'm five, seven. I'm, I'm the short guy. Oh yeah. yeah. I'm a, I'm a little, I'm like five, nine. So okay, yeah, I, got, I got a little bit, but you know, it's not definitely not, not. I, I'm sure, you know, my podcast partner, Justin, dude's like six, four, you know, and every, all my, oh, all is my he? Okay. Like, you know, <laughs> I, I dwarf them, you know, but, uh, they called me like, there's a, there's a snake in here. It's huge. And I was like, yeah, okay. So I ran across the field just barefoot, you know, I'm, I'm <laughs> hauling butt over there. I get in this chicken coop, dude. And I grabbed this rat snake and I pulled it up, dude. My arm was fully extended above my head, and this thing's still on the ground, like striking at me. This thing was pushing seven foot, dude. Really? It was it was huge. Biggest rat snake I've ever seen in my life. And then that day I actually ended up finding three because I found that one. I found another one in the chicken coop that was a bit smaller that I see. And that was a yellow? Yeah, that was a yellow. Okay. Yeah, that's all I get here are yellow. We get yellows okay. and corns. Gotcha. Um, those are the rat snakes we get around here and uh yeah just a beast just absolute dump truck of a yellow rat snake man you know it was awesome and i found a little bit smaller one that i found about a three footer over to the side a little bit and um so yeah they they are they're big snakes man they're some of the biggest you know north american colubrids we have here you know minus obviously indigos and some of your pictures but yeah awesome 
Yeah. And then, you know, you kind of touched on it a little bit. You mentioned chicks. You mentioned that chicken farm. What are you using as diet? Um, are you varying it up? Are you purely birds or, or what's it what's it like for you? It varies um, as baby when they're young. I, I'm solely mice, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you. There. Once they hit adult size, you know, I think I think the biggest problem we have in herpticulture is overweight snakes and that's because Probably. you know uh fluffy needs to be fed and a jumbo mouse every seven days on the dot and you know or a small rat you know especially these big rat snakes man people would look at my guy and be like oh he can take a small medium rat no problem i wouldn't even think about touching a rat with him dude you know rats number number one rats are extra fatty mice are bad enough yeah. as they are you know but rats are super fatty so i stay away from rats but as they grow they're always on mice and then once they hit adult size if they can take a jumbo mouse they can probably take a day old chick um so at that point i switch them over to a mainly chick diet um you know chick or quail you know whichever one you prefer quail are a little bit more there's a little bit more to them um so i, I like to do quail when i when i can get them Okay. Uh, but chicks are, you know, hey, I hate to say this because I'm I'm not cheap when it comes to my animals, but chicks are very, very cheap, very, very affordable. It's a very good way to vary your diet frequently. Quail are yes. not cheap. Um, so once they hit that adult size, I, I start hitting them with chicks more often than not. They get, you know, three out of three out of five meals will be a chick, you know, four out of five meals will be a chick. Then they'll get a mouse, you know. And okay. I I try and even some of my bigger stuff, I like to feed smaller mice, you know, because once you get to that jumbo size, they're a lot fattier. You know, there's a lot more to them. I I try to save those for females either going into breeding, like once they go into a cool down, I'll hit them with, you know, come some of those to build up a little bit of fat reserves and then they'll go down and then start them small and then once they're out and then work them back up to that, give them a couple and switch them over to chicks, you know? Okay. Um, but dude, rat snakes, they won't turn down a chick, man. They, yeah. They, they go nuts for those things. So I, I'm heavy. I'm heavy on chick diet with, with my stuff for sure. Cool. Yeah. And I could talk personally and, you know, just being honest, I mean, I, so I was always of the mindset where, not of the mindset but like just with what i can physically get as feeders like i was getting and i only had a you know i had a very small collection up until a couple of years ago now um you know i was getting my my texas rats on rats and i was getting them basically on like pups or weans and i was like feeding them that but like i i didn't really know as much as i do now and then as i came down here to florida my su food supply was like weird um and just what i could physically get it was mostly only rats available so i was feeding small rats to even my adults smalls or, or weaned rats depending on the size of them um but now that i have this quail supplier i am super excited to vary up that diet not have to spend that money on rats every week and yeah just all that because i know it's it's very beneficial i've been hearing from so many people about how good birds are for these animals so just in terms of health and breeding too so i'm curious to see what that kind of does for me yeah and the the biggest thing with man if i could do everything on quail i absolutely would um but right now quail aren't super cheap and then you know depending on i'm actually gonna look into the guy you plugged earlier um because yeah quail you know i go through you know i I go through who I can with rodents, you know, and um, I try to get the best quality. But dude, quail, there it's harder to get good quality quail. You want somebody who actually breeds them and feeds them a good diet and all that. Um, but regardless, man, quail are way, way less fatty than rats, and that's why I stay away from them. I only feed rats to my larger carpets and my big pituophis. I don't put. Yeah. I don't put anything on rats till they can eat a medium. 
you know? Okay. And even then, like, because that's all I get as far as rats, I get smalls and I get mediums because I, I interchange the pituofas, my big pits between smalls and medium rats. Um, but in any of the, the, those are the only things though. My rat snakes don't, don't touch rats. I don't, gotcha. I, don't I don't even offer them to them. You know, they're on chicks or, or mice and that sustains them because pituofas, pituofas have a very, very fast metabolism. So I don't worry about them getting as fat as easily. So they get a rat, you know, every seven, 10 day, about 10 days ish, you know, especially the adults, the younger ones are still on mice. They're about every seven seven or eight, nine days, you know, the, the adults, I might get bashed for this, but my adults will go two weeks, you know, because I be, and that's because I feed them fattier rats. Yeah. Know? My pits, my pits don't like it, you know, but they're very healthy and I don't want them to become overweight. Um, so I give them a medium rat about every 10 days to, you know, two weeks, depending. Um, and it also depends on the time of year right now I'm pushing, more of the two weeks because we're coming up on cooling cooling time um during the summer it's a little little bit heavier but when i do do heavier i do small rats um so it's not as not as much right now when i'm in the two week two week area i give them mediums just to you know give, okay. them, give them some reserves but gotcha and then you know you kind of led into this one so brumation so you're not in brumation yet no Okay. Uh, my area. So, uh, Justin, know oh, Justin and I kind of do things a little differently. He's brewmating stuff now, but the the problem is with my area in South Carolina, we're basically the Florida of South Carolina. It gets we get heavy, heavy warm days up until about January. Um, okay. So all the stuff I keep is pretty much southeastern. It, it's all southern, southeastern stuff. Um, and a lot of it's, a lot of it's from Florida. Most of my rat, pretty much all my rat snakes are from Florida. And so the way I think about it is Florida gets a solid month, month and a half of actual cold weather, you know, if that usually, and I'm, and I'm down in South Florida where today at like, if, uh, it was probably like 60 this morning and it felt exactly. cold. Exactly. And at 60 degrees, you know, if the sun's out, snakes will come out and bask, man. You know, so I, I wait till about January and I kind of wean stuff off of food, give them about a week to two weeks to clean out their systems. I'll drop yeah. temps a little bit in my room and then they'll go in my garage for about a month, month and a half, basically as long as it stays cold here. Um, but the problem is I wait till January because I know it's pretty much going to stay cold. Might get the occasional warm weekend or okay. something, but it's going to stay pretty cold and my garage holds the cold pretty well um december you know last week we had several days where it was 80 degrees here you know and yeah i don't it'll just it'll mess up their cycle man it'll get them moving and i i don't really want that when i put them down i want them to stay down you know for the most part because even in even in cooling they will move around they'll be semi-active yes. they've always got water all that stuff um but i wait till i can keep it at a constant 55 to 45 degrees in there and oh, wow. um, i let them hang out there for like i said about a month and then i kind of let the let the garage do what it's gonna do um i'll leave them in the garage even once it like gets towards the end of cooling i'll leave them in there because you don't want to do one extreme to the other you don't want to go from 80 degrees in my room to you know 55 degrees in the garage you want yeah. a little bit of a you know a, a drop down you know and uh so i kind of try to time it with the garage you know they'll go from here my room stays anywhere from 77 to about 81 maybe 82 on the hot side um, but i try to keep it around 80 in here so i'll put them in the garage when i know it's going to stay about 65 to 60 degrees and then they'll hang out in there for a week and then, you know, I know it's going to drop and then it's going to go down into the low 50s, 40s, you know, all that. So, um, but yeah, and then they'll hang out and then it's kind of the reverse, the reverse idea. As it warms up, I let the garage get up to about 60, 65, let them chill in there for about a week. And then I'll bring it back into the room. And okay, you know, from there, we, we, from there it's on, man, you know. <laughs> Yeah. So I'm curious to know how that like month to month and a half brumation has fared for you 
because you know i've over the last couple of years i've been hearing a lot of people you know they'll do the thanksgiving to valentine's day or they do like they have a set time in their head like so how has that kind of shortened brumation period worked in your uh collection in your favor last year so last year um was my first year breeding colubrids and um I would say it was a success uh, for the most part. So I got um, last year, I got Pasco County yellow rats and I got Santa Rosa County gray rats and the Pasco counties. I actually didn't cool myself. They were sent to me afterwards and they went okay. Florida yellow rats. Sometimes you don't even have to cool them. You know, you just co a lot of people co have them. They just do their thing. You know, um, I like the cycle, you know, it gives me time to kind of relax a little bit. Yeah. Um, but the gray rats, right right at it man you know as soon as they were out i gave the mail i gave them both you know a couple meals introduced the mail you know he was he would the way i worked it was he was in there all week until feeding i pulled him out i fed them both and then i put him back you know the next day or the day after and i got a perfect clutch from a first time female um she actually double clutched for me um first one i got 14 perfect eggs not a not a single slug no slugs the eggs were perfect every single egg hatched um it was you know as good as it could have been she didn't egg bind anything like that second clutch was a lot smaller a few slugs um and that was just from retained sperm because i didn't pair them up again um so. i had something similar happen this year on a on a first time girl she was like a five-year-old girl she went for me um didn't pair again. She gave me 13 eggs on the first go. And then she went again, gave me 11 and only one was good. And it hatched. Uh, yeah. That's uh, the, the mine, miracle egg. Yeah. Oh, mine no. was, mine was similar. Uh, like I said, first one was 14, all 14 hatched. Every single baby was perfect. Second clutch. I believe I had, I had f six good eggs that appeared good and then like four slugs, something like that. Um, so six of them looked good. Uh, four hatched on their own and they were perfect little snakes. By the way, that clutch, absolute sausage fest. I mean, I got, <laughs> at the end of the day, I think I ended up with, I had six, 14. I ended up with three females from the two clutches. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was bad. All, all males, you know? And, yeah. um, but, and then, so there were two eggs that looked good, um, but they didn't pip on their own. And I, you know, some people may not like this. I'm not much for cutting eggs. Um, okay. I'm one of those guys that like, you know, if it's not meant to happen, it, it's not going to happen. Um, with that said, um, I wait, I normally wait two to three days after everybody has come out of their eggs and I'll look in the egg just to see if it was bad, how the snake developed, all that stuff. And so I cut these two eggs and they were both alive. And I was like, oh, didn't expect that. It was three days after everybody else hatched. So I just kind of let them do their thing. One came out about a day later and although very, very small, he was okay. Um, I don't really know how he's going to fare. I'll probably end up keeping him or just giving him to somebody as a pet only animal, you know, because he's still very, very small. He's still assist feeding right now. Um, oh, wow. He eats immediately when he's got a pinky in his mouth, um, but he won't eat on his own at the moment. And then the other one eventually came out another day or two later, but it was severely deformed. And uh, so I ended up, euthanizing that individual um so that that cooling the cooling overall i think was a huge success um okay. i did also i also paired pituophis i've got i paired up my pair of albino florida pine snakes and a pair of brewster county fork line gopher snakes and um i had i didn't get a clutch from either one i thought the i thought the brewsters were gonna go um, but there was interest on both sides. The thing that I learned 
that I did not know previously was those pitcher ovus has a, have a lot shorter window for ovulation or for, um, I'm blanking on the word, but you have a shorter window to pair them up to where the female will be ready to go. Uh, fol okay. follicle development, you know, you've got it, you gotcha. got a, you got a shorter window for her to get those follicles. And, um, I waited about two weeks, you know, two to three weeks before I started pairing them up. Turns out once they're in the room, give them a meal, throw them together. It's gotta be bam, 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 quick. Um, the rat snakes I waited as well. They didn't care. Um, but the females, you, you got to, I mean, for the pitchy office, apparently it's a lot quicker of a process. Okay. So I think that's where I struck out. The male was definitely the male Florida pine was definitely interested. There was a lot of, a lot of that little, you know, bumping yeah, going the on. Yeah. yeah. The twitching. There's a lot of that. And then the Brewsters, I actually saw them locked up. They were together a ton. That's why I thought they were going to go. And I saw them like full on locked up. So I was like, all right, you know, I at least get them. Didn't get those either. So um, I think that's that was the main thing is I didn't do it quick enough. And they were right on the cusp of being old enough. Uh, they were both pairs of 2019s. And uh, so they were four years old. And I'm more of a five-year-old guy for females, you know, especially with okay. the Ophis, those bigger, bigger snakes. You know, rat snakes, four years, females, fine. A lot of people do three. You know, I'm a, I'm a yeah. minimum, I'm a minimum four-year guy. Um, for females, males, obviously two, three years old, good to go. Um, but females on minimum four picture of I, I prefer five. Um, so I think okay. this year, I think this year after having already been cycled, been with a, a partner, um, I, I, I have high hopes for this year. You know, obviously I'm not going to count my snakes before they hatch. Um, but I've, I've got a lot of high hopes for picture of this season. Gotcha. Yeah. And that's interesting with the, um, you know, that kind of age and I'm starting to see it more cause I've collected more animals now over the last couple of years. And I have a pair of like 2021 Texas rats that like just aren't there in terms of size. Like, you know, they'll be three years old this year, but I know I could not pair that female. The male, I, I actually do want to try pairing him and he's probably mature enough. Uh, they've been growing super well, but that female, I, I would not, try it she's definitely not at the size that i even want to risk being a mom but i i kind of do agree with you because last year with you know that five-year-old girl going and seeing how many eggs she gave and just how big she is because she's probably a good five feet like a nice chunky girl she maintains real good weight so um i think you know the weight is worth it for some of these animals yeah man you know and that's that's one thing i rush everybody and yeah, you know, I've had a few people ask me, you know, like, oh, what do you recommend for somebody getting into this? And my number one thing is always don't rush it. If you rush into this, you know, you're going to end up with snakes that you don't know what to do with, or you're going to stress out your animals, or you're going to, there's so, there's so many factors, man. And my thing is like, you know, let, let them acclimate to you, let them acclimate to your room, you know, how you do things give them, give them time, man. You know, there, there shouldn't be a rush in this, you know, like there's, yeah. I waited, God, man, six, seven, eight years from getting animals to actually breed them. You know, like I, I wanted to breed so bad for so long, but it was never, I was never in a good point in life to do it. I, I there were so many factors in all of it. You know, I, I waited a really long time to breed and, um, you got to be ready, man. You're responsible for those animals and, and there, there shouldn't yeah. be a rush in any of this. If you really want it, you can, you should be able to wait another year. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. You know, and I'm a big, I'm a big proponent of, you know, if you're doing this, it, it's always good to raise up your animals. Obviously, you know, the, the first snakes I bred, I didn't buy them as babies. Yeah. I'm not going to sit here and lie, but I much prefer to buy babies and raise them myself um, just yeah. because they acclimate you know, so much better and uh, all that. But even then the adults, they were young adults when I bought them. Um, but I still waited, I think two or three years before, after I had them to actually pair them. It wasn't like, okay, I got these adults, let's pair them up. You know, like yeah. you're at, you're asking for trouble if you do that, man, you know, that, that's a really good way to stress 
animals out. It's a real good way to have egg bound females. It's a real good way to kill females. You know, um, breeding is a breeding in a controlled environment is a stressor on these things. And so you want to minimize all of that as much as possible. You know, uh, any new stuff, you know, I, I give it a minimum year, maybe even two before I even think about pairing. If it's an adult, I'm at a point in my collection now, I don't buy adults, um, whenever possible. Um, if it's something specific and I recently got, you know, I got slapped in the face because I bought some adults and, you know, this beautiful pair of locality pine snakes and, um, they were sold as adults and you really don't see county specific locales of, of Southern pines. And, uh, so me and a buddy went in on them and a month later the female rolled on me and it was oh, man. just an absolute gut shot dude i mean just an incredible snake she was six and a half feet long just absolutely beautiful and prime and um you know she she rolled you know very shortly after receiving her so it's just there's there's so much that goes into all of it man you gotta you gotta be careful and you gotta be patient yeah definitely um one thing i also wanted to ask about do you brewmate like your hold back hatchlings like in their first couple years even if they're not breeding because it's something that a uh, couple guests ago of mine, uh, Alvaro, with his hog nose, something he's doing. And he made a good point. I've heard other people say, it, you know, get them used to that cycle. And I'm actually doing it with mine, just kind of a more abbreviated one. Probably I'm going to do about a month for them mm-hmm. and then pull them out uh, just to kind of feel the change and then get them right back on food and, and keep boosting them up. But how do you feel about that or do you do that at all? I'm 100% on board with it and I do it to an extent. So like I said, because I cool in my garage, I, if I could cool my entire room, I would cool every single bird I own, you know, like in an ideal world, I would have three different rooms, you know, that's of course. So would everyone, (laughs) I would have a hatchling room that they were kids not because I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to cool anything their first year i would start cooling their their second okay. year if i could yeah because i've thought about this a, a ton dude and so i'd have a hatchling area where they could live their first years a colubrid room and a python room so with the pythons yes i i cycle them from the get-go you know because with my pop wins i normally drop the room temp cut them off of food for about two three months and then you know and that's their breeding time is during that two three months and okay. then back on the food. I do that from the get go with all my pop wins. That's they're they're all on the same schedule from babies to adults. Um, the colubrids. I'm probably going to try it this year. Um, certain things are going to get cold, cold. They're going to go in the garage, but the entire collection is going to be off of food for about three weeks to a month. And I'm going to drop my room temperatures in here down to about. 65 to 70 and then just let them ride for about a month and then race okay. them back up. Um, gotcha. Cause I know some people that do that even for their adults just to get breeding. Um, so I'll be, I'll be honest with you. So my, my brumation, like I don't have anything crazy. I don't have really room for some big like fridge type deal. And what I did last year and what I'm repeating again to see how well it works with multiple pairings now, cause I've more than one, um, they're actually up in those like lock tubs in my closet in my room, as opposed to my garage. Where in my garage right now, this is my snake area. So obviously in Florida, the ambient's a little bit warmer. Um, they're up in my room. Uh, it's been getting down to as low as 65 in there from both the AC and just it's been getting a little bit cooler at night. And it'll get as high as maybe 73. I did that last year and it worked. Yeah. I I got eggs. So clearly something worked there. I'm repeating it again to see what my success rate is. Again, it's not the super 50 degree brumation. If I could get down there, I would, I would love to, but not in the cards at the moment. Hey man, there's a lot of those Southern type of snakes. That's all they need. And the th- the only thing with that is you don't want to do it for a super long period because their systems are still going right you know, yeah. heavily at, in those types of temperatures. It's and cool. Last- it's cool enough to slow them down, but not cold enough to shut them down. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, so do it for a shorter time, dude. You know, a lot of the southern stuff. That's that's all they need. 
you know. And last year I pulled them out, I think in mid January, because it started getting a lot warmer yeah. here again. So I was like, all right, we're not going to go to that Valentine's Day. Like it's not, it's not going to work. It's just so warm. So I'm like, there's no point. Just put them back and keep it rolling. That's why I so. really like keeping stuff from the environment that I'm in because I yep. let, I let the outside do the talking. You know 100%. what I mean? I follow I follow weather patterns. You know, I do all that stuff. I I'm watching temperatures and and I I follow that stuff, man. You know, and a lot of times your southeastern colubrids they 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 need a cycle, but that's it. It doesn't have to be. You know, obviously if you get northern stuff that has to get cold that's a completely different story you know some of your montane stuff you know you, you gotta they gotta get cold cold you know but your southeastern colubrids or even southern colubrids where it stays hot you know and it only gets cold for a month you know maybe two then that, that's all they need man they just need that cycle to make that thing click in their brain to be like oh it's winter you know and then come out of it hit them with food and it gets them going, man. Yeah. And in my listening to uh Clubrid and Clubroid radio, shout out Zach, Matt, and Clint. Um cast out, he, man. Yeah, it, it's awesome. Uh I I definitely took a, a page out of their book. I, I I love their shit, so I'll give them all the props in yeah. the world. But um what I've learned from them also what I feel makes up for the lack of a temperature drop, I make up for in not feeding and light because they're in the closet. So they're dark all the time. And then those um, are the, in my opinion, those are the biggest things is because that's what happens is, you know, there's not as much food around. It's a little bit colder and they're normally burrowed. So it's dark. You hit yeah. those two things, man, cut them off of food, leave it dark. That's going to stimulate that winter period. Even if it's not that cold, you know, because you yeah. know, the outside, man, it's not, in these areas, especially in your area, it's not, it's never that cold. You know what I mean? No, it is but, not. So, and, it's, and it's for cool. anyone watching, I'm not necessarily advocating do what I do because not everything works for everyone. I saw that it worked last year. So that's why I'm repeating and trying again. And that's what I can do within my means. So, and that's different things. And I would go ahead. I was just going to say, that's the wonderful thing about you know, a lot of your North American colubrids, man, there's a lot of, there's a lot of ways to do it. And yep. none of them are really wrong. You know, it's what works for you. And if it works for the animals, they're healthy, they're happy. You know, it's, it's all good, man. Yeah. And I always maintain the stance when it comes to any species, if it works for you, it works for you. doesn't matter what anyone says. If you have the same success as the other person doing something, completely different then so be it absolutely. it is what it is absolutely all right um let's see anything i missed about colubrids oh something i like talking about on here kind of in all other reptiles freestyle so obviously we talked about the um carpets a little bit i did see a post with a barons racer um you know i talked to sky this past week about those guys and then I saw some like cave geckos. What other species am I missing? Do you have some some other miscellaneous things around? So not really. First of all, Sky is one of my best friends. He, I literally this last week and I was down there and I hung out with him. We did some herb. Oh, okay. He's an amazing guy. One of my best friends. One of the best dudes in the hobby. If you haven't checked him out, you need to at Hell Scales and Peach Throat Passion. Um, but with that said, I don't have the cave geckos anymore. Um, that was kind of a, that was a short lived thing. I was in the geckos previously and my buddy, Chris Painchap produced these. He's really into geckos. And I was like, those are really cool. I want to try them. And yeah. they just didn't, they didn't jive with my room. Um, at the time my bedroom was quarantined. So I didn't want to keep them in there. Kept them in the snake room it's too hot. They didn't, they didn't do okay. well. Um, cave geckos are pretty, they're not, they don't need to keep them at 60 degrees all the time, you know, but they're more of a mid seventies, you know, kind of gecko gotcha. and it's high seventies, low eighties in here. And so they just didn't go well. And, uh, so I gave them the Justin, Justin sent them somewhere else. And, you know, I'm not sure who they're with now, but I know they're still alive. Um, but those okay. are awesome geckos. 
Um, and I do have, yes, I do have Barons racers. I only have a pair. Those are awesome, awesome snakes. I love my Barons. And I also keep Nerodia. Um, okay. I've, got, I've got several, not a, not a ton, not like Chris Montross, but I have, yeah. I have quite a few at this point. And okay. I think that's everything. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. And the hogs. And, you know, it's basically Pichuophis, it's Pantherophis, you know, mainly yellows, uh, Pichuophis, you know, some locality bulls, some gophers, some pines, mostly pines. I'm, I, I like pine snakes more than any of them. And uh, Mexican pine snakes, especially Pichuophis Depi, Depi Jani, um, just the, the best pitch you can get your hands on. Um, and then Nerodia, and I've got the Barons. I think that's, I think that's about it. And hog noses. Cool. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. And then, um, mentioned it at the beginning of the show, something I wanted to dive in. And for those who, you know, saw the thumbnail, uh, that's a wild black rat snake that you had caught and you're an avid herper. Um, let's talk about that a little bit. Cause I, I meant to talk about it with sky last week. And I completely forgot. And that was my bad. Uh, but herping something really cool and me living in South Florida now, it's something I have not done, which is unfortunate for me. But um, yeah. can you talk about that a little bit and what, you know, you've kind of done in your area or where you've gone maybe? Yeah, um, I, I can't say I've gone to a lot of really cool places. You know, most of my stuff's been done locally. I've been herping since I was, you know, a young teenager. Uh, with the same guy that introduced me into snakes, you know, my, my friend's dad, he took us road cruising when I was a kid and, uh, that's kind of what really got it going. And, um, you know, I, I've heard my area a lot, you know, I've done a lot of stuff here. We have a very, very big variety of snakes here. I've caught everything from ribbon snakes to mud snakes in my area um which you know was yeah you know, that the mud snake i caught was just yeah it's my, probably the coolest snake i've ever found um you know everything you know i found a lot of snakes here um i've heard herp a little bit in south texas when i was living there um you know stuff like diamondback water snakes uh western diamondback rattlesnakes which you know if anybody's listened to the podcast i've actually been bit by a western diamondback and uh really yeah, not a not a fun experience. Um, oh, shit. But uh, yeah, so I've had some hands, literal hands on experience with those. Um, but they're awesome snakes. Uh, we get cane breaks around here. I, I've, I've seen a lot, a lot of cane breaks here. I, I absolutely love cane break rattlesnakes. Um, and then I've done quite a bit in Florida as well. Um, I've been to the Apalachicola area, did spend a weekend out there. And then I've done this year. I've I've gone to Central Florida a few times to see Sky, and uh, now my oh, buddy, wow. my buddy Preston lives down there, and uh, that's who I was staying with this last weekend. We did some herping in his area, which is around Seminole County, and then over to nice. over to Sky's neck of the woods, and uh, then a little bit in Georgia as well. We did a pretty big herp trip this year down in Georgia. Which was a lot of fun. Uh, found a found an eastern king snake, and that's where I got that nice. black. That's where I got that black rat snake. I was my lifer, which was awesome, being the rat snake cool. guy that I am. Um, but yeah, man, you know, around here, I a lot of people call it cheating. I call it efficiency. Uh, road cruising. A lot of people kind of look down on people who road cruise. I have found more snakes road cruising than. Yeah, how, how's that cheating? I don't know, man. Some people just don't <laughs> like it. I love road cruising. You're telling me I don't have to hike and I'm going to find more snakes? <laughs> that sounds like a win-win to me, you know? Um, obviously, you can't beat flipping over a log or a piece of wood or tin and finding a snake. You know, that's yeah. that's the coolest feeling, man, you know? But it's also really cool to see a snake on the road whip off into the grass and jump out and, you know, you know shine these things, man. You know, it's... It's a lot of fun and I found a lot of really cool stuff road cruising, man. You know, around here, our predominant venomous snake is the copperhead. I have found more copperheads than you can shake a freaking stick at, dude. Um, but it's cool to see the variety, man. You know, they're in such high numbers here. There's we have so much variety here, but 
I've road cruised any everything from you know copperheads, cotton mouths, you know rattlesnakes, uh, corn snakes, rat snakes, um, Nerodia. We have a lot of banded and red belly water snakes around here. Um, so I, I love it, man. You know, it, th the one downside to road cruising is you find a lot more dead snakes as well. Um, right. That's always a uh, it's always heartbreaking, man. That it's probably the worst part of road cruising. It's it's a lot easier. Yeah dead snakes you don't you don't really find dead snakes when you're out flipping at least not very often i can maybe count on one hand the amount of times i've been out flipping and found something dead road cruising dozens on dozens on dozens oh yeah i'm sure so um yeah man i've been i've been herping since i was you know a kid man and like i said my neighbors had had a chicken coop and you know so i was always running over there and catching rat snakes and you know, different stuff in my yard and whatever I could find, man, you know, been bit by a lot of black racers, been bit by a lot of Nerodia, you know, um, I followed into when I was in South Texas, um, I fell into the swamp catching about a, a almost six foot, uh, diamondback water snake, okay. which was just awesome. You imagine a Nerodia <laughs> pushing six foot long. That's, yeah, that's big. a beast of an animal. Um, so, you know, I, I just, I love it, man. You know, and I think that's being the field herper that I am is really what ignited my want for more locality colubrids, you know? Yeah. Um, just getting, kind of getting back to my roots and, you know, kind of what started it all is these colubrids, man. And, you know, field herping really kind of brought me back down the earth with that. And uh, I've done a lot over the last I don't know. Long time. <laughs> Done a lot, man. You know, finding pygmy rattlesnakes are always some of my favorite snakes to find. We found one this last weekend. Um, nice. Which was just absolutely awesome. Um, you know, and around here, dude, there's nothing better. Several, it was several years ago now, but I found a, about a five, almost six foot cane break rattlesnake out at a wildlife management area here locally and just, you know, super, it's a super blonde gold color with a perfect orange stripe down its back, just nice. taking up almost an entire section of road, man. And it's, yep. you can't beat that, you know, it, yeah. it's, there's, there's something to be said about just viewing these things in their natural environment and habitat. That is just, just amazing, man. You know, so that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, couple more things getting back to your collection a couple things i forgot to touch on um what is your potential outlet for moving some of your offspring do you plan on vending shows do you go through morph market what what's your kind of plans with that as you start to breed a little bit more in the collection so i don't really have much of a desire to vend shows i probably okay. if i got on a heavier if i really start producing stuff i might look into trying to vend daytona um but it's a little harder because you have to have a florida breeder's license down there yes. you know your class a or whatever it is the and, class uh, three yeah class three yeah and um i don't know of a lingo for florida you know south carolina is a, law, a lawless wasteland dude it, it's <laughs> it's almost kind of pathetic i'm not gonna lie but it makes it easy on the other people yeah, i'm are. just glad i'm just glad i got my permit but that's a different story <laughs> <laughs> yeah dude south carolina if uh you got sometimes not even but uh if you got an id that shows you're over 18 and a couple hundred bucks you can go to columbia repticon and buy a black mamba if you want uh really yeah it's it's it, like i said it's kind of pathetic dude it, it, it's it's bad you know people you go to the columbia repticon show they've got a whole section of venomous animals which is really cool to see, but you know, they've got mambas, cobras, gaboon vipers, puff adders, you know, anything you can imagine is there and you just got to be 18. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I could, I could see why maybe, you know, seeing that stuff locally and just the ethics of that could maybe turn you off from wanting to be yeah. at those local shows yeah i don't you know columbia is a bit of a drive daytona it's almost it's actually funny daytona is actually only about an hour further than columbia is i can be in daytona in three and a half hours, oh really four hours yeah it's it's not far at all um but yeah dude i don't i i just don't want to be associated with all that you know repticons really just a bunch of flippers 
you know, pretty much all over the country. And it's just not really, it's not my scene. I haven't even been to one. I went to one, I think last year I went to one to meet up with my buddy who gave me some hogs and my Barons racers. Um, you know, it's a meetup that we walked the show and stuff, but unless I need supplies or something, I don't, I don't go. I only right. go to Daytona every year. That's a must. Um, so if, as far as selling goes, um, and I, I don't even have a morph market right now and I don't really plan on it to be honest. You know, I've been, I've, I've been very fortunate with the podcast, you know, um, you know, like I said, the, the herpeticulture podcast, we, we've been going for going on six years now we've been doing the podcast okay. and um, I've been very fortunate with that. It grew pretty quick early on and um, anything I have for sale, I pretty much, you know, talk about it. I know enough people that, you know, they normally just hit me up. And yeah, I've been very, very fortunate in that aspect. Um, I am getting to the point to where I have stuff that needs to, you know, some of the babies, you know, kind of need to get out the door. Um, we're more looking towards making a website than anything. Um, nice. It's nothing against Morph Market, but it's changed a lot. And if I have to, I will. Um, but I also don't have, I, I have a lot, a lot of snakes. I work two jobs to feed them and i don't yeah. have a lot of excess income to afford a morph market you know because yeah I think, right. a, I think there's a free version but you can post like one yeah there's not much you could do yeah yeah so i haven't even done that yet um if i have to i will um yeah it's worked very well for a lot of people you know if i get a carpet python clutch this year I might end up making one, but the carpets fly off way quicker than, <laughs> than the right. Cobra birds do. Of uh, course. So, cause there's not that many people looking for Pasco County yellow rats, you know? Right. But it's what get my juices flow. And so I don't really care. I'll hold on to them as long as I need to. Yeah. Um, so it, it's pretty much, you know, we're working towards a website, but a lot of it's just word of mouth. You know, I, I've got a good group of locality guys and we all kind of, either trade, you know, and if it comes down to it, dude, I, I don't do this to sell stuff. You know, I, I'll hit up a buddy who might be interested and I'll be like, dude, if you cover shipping, I'll send them to you. Right. You know, like, I'd much rather them go to good hands than make, make a buck. You know, like I said, I work a second yeah. job solely to feed my collection and have a little, gotcha. bit of, little bit of a savings. So, you know, that's, that's covered, you know, so I don't, Obviously, it's nice to sell stuff. You know, I like selling yeah. stuff. I prefer it, you know, but if stuff really has to go, I got a group of people that I'll just be like, hey, man, cover shipping and you can have it. You know, I'd much rather much rather see them go to a good home to somebody that I know than to some random person and make, you know, 200 bucks. You know, that's just, just right. my, my, my take on it, you know. And I also, I've been given... God, I've, I've been so blessed over the years from people that I know. I've been given a lot, a lot of snakes. And so I, I really want to give back in that scenario. Yep. I'm not saying I just give away all my stuff, you know, but if somebody's really, if somebody's really interested in these, but, you know, financially they can't afford it, you know, I'll be like, you know, I'll just send them to you, dude. You know, give me back later. Yeah. You know, I don't I'm I'm all about. I've, I've had a I've had a similar experience, so yeah, I, I definitely feel you there. Yeah, so you know, it, it's really, it all depends, you know. But um, yeah, man, I just want them to go to good homes, and if I have to sit on them for two years, and I gotta sit on them for two years, you know. I sat on my, you know, I had a my last carpet clutch was in 2020. I sat on every single one of those babies for two two and a half years before i sold any of them you know just okay. because i wanted to see how they looked and i just i didn't really want to let them go you know it's not a yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't it's always good to fund the rodent bill that's always a perk you know but it's not yeah. why, it's not why i do this you know so it's i don't worry about it i do have to start thinking about it a little bit more heavy because next season i'm i've got four rat snake pairings i'm planning and two pituophis pairings and you know that's based on last year i had i only had two i only had two rat snake clutches 
and I had almost 40 babies between the two. So yeah. Double that plus some, you know, that's, it, that's a lot of mouths. So yeah, I got to, no, I'm going to have to work something out. But again, you know, I'm not too worried about covering the road and bill. You know, I serve, you know, at a restaurant one day a week and I get paid cash and all that goes nice. straight into rodents. So I, I get that, got that covered. So cool. That's what it is. All right. And then I also wanted to ask, so when it comes to the locality stuff, is there anything you've noticed between the localities? I kind of touched on this before, like phenotypically, anything that you've noticed that you're kind of shooting for, like patterns or, or colors here and there that you're trying to recreate or make better in the offspring? Anything specific you want to talk about? <sighs> All of it, dude. I mean, so yeah. I'm very, I'm not nitpicky, you know, especially with the locality stuff. You kind of have to get what you get. Right. Uh, but, you know, so with my Pasco County babies, uh, the male who unfortunately is no longer with us, he did not acclimate to my setup well. He was always very shy, but he went downhill pretty quick after I received him, which was extremely unfortunate. Um, but female is doing great. She's just an incredible snake. And I got a very healthy clutch. I think I've, I have, I got like 26 babies out of her, 24 babies out of her or something. So okay. that was great. But so I look at things from like the beginning with the Pasco clutch. I had really dark animals. I had a really, really dark babies. I had really light babies. Then I had some that are kind of in between. So I'm starting from the beginning with those. I'm selling or giving all the ones that are in between to people selling. Those are the for sales. I'm keeping a pair of the darkest ones and I'm keeping a pair of the lightest ones and I'm going to see how they develop. And if I, if it goes how I think they are, they're going to like the parents, you know, you could tell with the male, he was a little bit more pale and the female a little bit darker. Um, so stuff like that you look for, um, and it's definitely harder with the, the yellow rats, obviously, yeah. cause they hatch out like, I, like, you know, grays or Texas, mm -hmm. I, however you want to compare them. And yeah. then you kind of got to wait for that color change. Yeah, exactly. And that's why, you know, these, these started turning yellow really, really early. Um, okay. early on they started turning yellow. Like, I mean, before their first shed, they were getting some color, which was, oh, all right. which is wild for these, because even with most yellow rats, they're gray for at least a couple sheds. Um, yeah. so that was really interesting to see. Um, so anything that I pick out of an animal that I like, I kind of shoot for. So, my female Seminole, I have right now, I have a pair of Seminole County yellows that I own, and then I have a male on loan with me right now. And my male is very heavily striped, um, or he's got thicker, not even thicker, he's got more prominent stripes, you know, darker stripes. And my female is just such an incredible snake, not taking away anything away from the male. Um, but the female has very, very faded stripes and almost a purple undertone to her. And I was like, that's, that's what I want. That's the look I want to go for to one day create a almost patternless yellow rat snake that could have, or turn those stripes purple. I don't know. You know, I just want to see where it goes. And so I've got a male here on loan that mimics her a lot more than my male does. So I'm going to pair those up. And that's where it gets a little bit harder. That's where you have to hold back every single one of those babies to see how they turn out. And that's what I'm going right. to do. What if the Seminole counties go, I might, you know, I'll let some go. If the guy who gave me the mail on loan wants any, I'll give him some, you know, might let a buddy or two get a pair if they are really serious about it. But other than that, I'm keeping every single one to see how they turn out, find out which ones are much more faded, have that same look and go from there. You know, okay. um, they all, all the counties have their own little small traits. Now, don't get me wrong to most people, a yellow rat, a yellow rat, a yellow rat. They're all trash. <laughs> they're all trash. You know, like if you, to, to a lot of people, you know, to me, they're just gold. You know, I, right. I love, I love them so much. Um, but each 
county has its own look, you know, like a lot of the, I work with a group of Hernando counties. A lot of those have like little orange patches in them. You know, it's very minute, but it's there, you know, like my big boy Rico, he's a Hernando, but he's got like these orange dots on his back that, you know, you can't really even pick up in a picture, but it's there. So stuff like that. My Hernan, my other Hernando female has this weird patternless creamy looking head i don't know what it is about her head but it's so clean and it stands out and she's just an incredible animal so i'm like what am i going to get from those two going together you know and then probably going to hold back a lot of those you know it's there's a lot that goes into it and then with the gray rats like my male so i've got santa rosa county gray rats and i've got apalachicola gray rats that cover two counties um and so my Santa Rosa is the Apalachicola is they're pretty much gray. My female is really, really light gray. My male's got a little bit more pattern to him, a little bit heavier. Uh-huh. Um, but the Santa Rosa is they're known for a pinkish red look. And my male has that pink look to him. And he, he's very, very pink. The female, she's more gray, but she's got pink or red patterning in her, you know, and I really like the pink look, you know, it's something a little different. So I held back animals that I hope turn out to be a little bit more pink, but as babies, it's very, very hard to tell how they're going to turn out. Um, so I'm holding back 2.1 of the gray rats for myself to see how they turn out. And, um, I've got high hopes, you know, even the babies right now, their bellies are pink. Cool. And they're only a couple months old. So, There's something about all of them, man, you know, and I just recently got a new locality of gray um, that is really, really dark, like super, super dark, almost brown with black saddles. You know, they're they're really cool. And I got a group of 4.2. I sent 2.1 to my buddy Preston. We're doing a lot of locality projects together. Um, so a very good friend of mine was, you know, nice enough to send me these babies. He had a wild caught female dropped eggs. They incubated. He sent me six of them. Um, so I kept three, gave three to my buddy Preston and, you know, right now they're really, really light, really, really gray. And, um, just gotta grow them up and see, see how it goes, man. You know, um, yeah, there's, there's little things about every single one that that's different, man. You know, and I've got. I, I'm not going to say I have like the eye for what's good, but I pick out stuff that I like. Yeah. I yeah. Of course. Cool. And I want to emphasize that as much as possible. You know, yep. And that's where like line breeding, you know, morphs are a instant gratification thing. I get nothing against morphs. If, if that's your thing, yeah. I do not. I basically want to make stuff to make your morphs cooler. You know, yeah. that, that's, that's what I want to do, you know? And no, yeah. and, and I, and I get it. I'll, I have, morphs only i don't have anything that's locality specific um in terms of you know with my texas rats at least uh would i like to have maybe a side project if i was able to find a pair of animals i thought looked cool yeah 100 percent. i'd I'd like that um right now I, i got the morphs but i like i said at the beginning i appreciate the line breeding you know seeing these natural colors and you have um a couple very good species that you're able to get good colors on. And they're not really like drab, like boring snakes. Like honestly, like the yellows and the the gray rats, like those are, those are good animals I'd say to be able to work with. Yeah. Yeah, man, for sure. You know, and I just, you know, the goal with this whole thing is just to bring light to them, man. You know, everybody, you know, that's the thing in North America is, everybody finds yellow rats and it's just like, Oh, that's the $20 rat snake that some flipper just caught outside, you know, and he threw on his table, you know, like, no, there, there's so, there's so much more than that, man. There's so, there's so much personality to all of them. They're really active. They're basically North American carpet pythons, you know, but we take advantage of it because we see them every day, you know? And so I, I, my goal is just bring more light into them. You know, I've got, I've got some really specific localities, you know, um, of yellows. I've got Everglades. I work with, I work with, um, I have Glades County, Amels, 
Glades County Het Amels, and I also have Hendry County Everglades, and I also have Glades County Yellow Rats. Um, so it's it's just a variety of, of stuff, man. You know, Everglades. Obviously, everybody loves Everglades. Those are probably the the exception to the whole rat snakes or dirt snakes thing. <laughs> you know, Everglades are just incredible, man. I've got several now, and um, they're amazing. Especially the Amels, man. They're they're incredible. Um, is Chris the one with the pale sided ones? I keep seeing yes. someone. Put, yeah, it is Chris. Yeah. Okay, those yeah. are fantastic. Yeah. I, I had to comment on one of the pictures. I'm like, if I had room, I'd be all over those. Yeah, like, dude, they look great. That and he's the uh, they just popped out in a in a yeah. clutch man. Oh. Like it wasn't like something the the adults showed it. Like he just they just yep. showed up and they were different. Um, so that's cool. I think my stuff might be slightly het pale side um i don't have any visual pails which you know that's i'm not really worried about that one um i like honestly i like the normal pails better than the amel pails because it shows it really shows the the loss of pattern a lot more than in the amels the amels you can't see it as well it's definitely there you can see it but you see a normal pale side oh my god dude they're super super cool so um that's kind of you know if, if i end up with some cool if i don't i'm not too worried about it um but i'm i'm kind of on the hunt to get as many if not all the locality specific morphs that i can get and i added a ton this year i added the amel glades um i recently added amel golf hammocks you know thanks to thanks to chris of course yeah um, I've got Jefferson County, uh, lemon gray rats from Tony Dungara, um, which those are really cool. They're still in quarantine from Daytona. Um, but really, really cool. I've got a visual male and two hundred percent het females. Um, what else is there? I think that's all the pure morphs I've got right now. Um, uh, but I've got. I'm looking into moonshines. I've got a buddy that got me okay. has, that has moonshines that are from the original stock. Um, so I'm waiting to get those. Those are a yellow, a yellow type. Um, so, you know, just something to add a little bit of flavor, you know, something to play around with, um, you know, with my line breeding. Cause dude, I'm so, I'm so line breeding oriented that I want to see what I can do the, the, to the morphs, you know, as well. Okay. So, cool it's it's kind of the goal um working on it you know then of course like i said i've got albino florida pines which are just <laughs> incredible dude uh, they're they're yeah. so awesome um anything pine snake but got the albino floridas i've got black pines i've got northern pines um like mexican north mexican pines depii janine dude they if anybody out there listening wants the best pituophis in the whole freaking world, it is the it is Jedi. They are just on a, on a whole other level on with pituophis. They're just incredible. I think I've got I've got three point two now, and if I could have a whole army of them, I, I would without <laughs> without a doubt. They're they're incredible. Nice. Um, and then you've got stuff like Deckard's rats, which hardly anybody has, let alone have even heard of. Um, it's just a yellow type from Southern Key Largo, but they've got their okay. whole whole own little look to them, man. Very, very unique rat snakes. Those are by far my favorite rat snakes, without without a doubt. Um, really? If you, yeah, then they don't get because they don't get as stripy as normal yellows. They're a little bit darker almost a rusty color to them um they get pretty big they're they're just really really cool little locality dude and i've got 2.2 nice. of those now um so yeah awesome so you kind of like half answered my next question these are kind of like my wrap-up questions yeah. per se um so besides you know the localities obviously you know that's all your goal you kind of just laid it all out for us um any other things you want to add to like the foreseeable future of longleaf reptilia any species ads potentially like what are what's on the horizon for you uh, man it's there's always stuff i want 
Um, of but course. Stuff I know I don't need. Um, in the near future, like I said, moonshine is so the next thing on the dock to to add. Um, I just fit, finished off my southern pine pair. I had a male. I needed a normal female. Just finished that off, so that was great. Um, Jan and I are always on the dock. Um, if I find some that are healthy from a good breeder, I normally always try and get those. They're just, they're awesome. And, um, blue barons, definitely. Um, okay. I, I've got a pair of greens, but I really, really like the blues. Those are on the dock eventually. Um, I don't, Lord knows when, or even if I should, cause my room's, my room's pretty full right now. Um, but I've got some, I've got some tubs so I can make space. Uh, um, <laughs> But those, those are definite blue barons. I got to have got to got to have them kind of waiting on Skylar to produce those, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. He, he's I don't my, blame you. I have a guy for everybody, you know, and if I got to wait a few extra years to get what I want, yeah. that's fine. You know, I don't mind. I don't mind waiting. I can be patient. Um, other than that, man, you know, I eventually I want to add a one of the dwarf species of, of boa constrictors um like okay. hog islands I, I really really like hog islands um so i'd like to i'd like to add those at some point because i've always had a soft spot for you know true boa constrictors and uh, but i i like the smaller ones you know um so if i can get if i can get some hog islands down the road that would be a, a huge one um but other cool. than that man i'm kind of I'm kind of coasting. I got a freaking ton of snakes right now and yeah, I don't need to be adding any serious numbers. Um, so I, if certain things pop up, you know, kind of a grab them now or possibly never see them again, you know, I'll, I'll get them. Um, but you know, I'm really happy with where I'm at right now, man. You know, I've got, I've got localities of everything I want. All of the obsoleta, you know, the formerly known obsoleta rat snakes, you have Texas rats, yellow rats, gray rats, all that stuff. Yeah. I've got at least one of pretty much all of them at this point. Um, you know, the Chris. What, what do you What do you label them as? Still, what what What's your stance on taxonomy? I label them, but uh, I don't have a stance on the taxonomical side of it. I label them by their color phase and where they're from. That's just that's just okay. what I. Um, if we're getting technical, so, you know, you know so I go by, class, go ahead. For my class three, you have to list like species names. So I went yeah. the full, I went the full three names. I went Pantherophists, Obsoletus, uh, Lynn Hymeri for yeah. the Texas rats. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I do that on my boxes too. The, the one or couple I've shipped out, yeah. um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Cause yeah. you know, it's all up in arms. Cause now we go. You know, all the Texas, they're all the Western rat snake and, and that. Right. It, but who, yeah, it's, who knows? Uh, it's, it's all weird, man. You know, if I if I'm going like true ta taxonomical, you know, I I would rather call yellow rats, you know, by the quadrifatatus, you know, uh, but now they're Alleghenyensis along yeah. with Everglades and, you know, all, all that stuff, you know, but I've actually got a big poster right here that has all of the pantherophis ones on them uh, i need that dude it's I it's awesome it. man it's uh, have you ever <laughs> have you heard of drawn to scales um i feel like i've heard the name yeah i can't donovan winterberg um okay so you got his website is drawn the scales dude uh, i've got some of his artwork in here but he made a poster it's got you know black rats, yellow rats, Everglades, grays, eastern fox, western nice. fox, Texas, you know Great Plains, Slowinskis, thorn scrubs. It's got gotcha. all of them on one big poster. It's like a centerpiece of my snake room now, you know. And it's nice. It's really cool. So I go off the old taxonomy, you know, for being technical. You know, they're all you know all the east, all the eastern rats are are um, Alleghenyensis now but um yeah. you know nowadays just to save confusion it's a seminole county yellow it's a yeah, santa, santa rosa county gray rat you know and just i just leave it at that you know i don't yeah it's all i don't think they should have been lumped at all um but i'm not a scientist so yeah <laughs> all right uh, cool yeah yeah 
But down um, the road, man, if you want a cool locality at Texas Rat, man, I, I got you. Uh, I'll send you. I'll yeah, a hundred percent. Send me the pictures because I'll be interested yeah. to see. Yeah, I have to get some updated ones in my younger ones now because they're starting to turn black. But the the adults okay. and they yeah, they almost look like demon snakes, man. They're just black and red and just yeah, just, that's cool. They're so wicked, man. So they're my only Texas rat snakes and. I was glad to just kind of tick that, you know, tick that mark for having hundred percent the other obsolete, you know, that isn't down yep. here, you know. So gotcha. Um, and then overall I like asking people because of like where we're just at right now and all the things going on. Um, what are your overall thoughts on the reptile hobby today and as we proceed into the future, just in general? Um yeah that's it's a loaded it's a loaded question. Cool. i know <laughs> yeah it's a loaded question um there's a lot of negative out there man but i don't focus on that you know i i've become very in my box when it comes to reptiles you know obviously i have a podcast so a lot of yeah that people listen to and so but i I really stay in my little corner. You know, I, I really talk to, I talk to the people that mean a lot to me. You know, these guys have become my family, man, you know, and, and I really stick, I stick to them and I stick to positivity, you know, all the, yeah. all the, you know, BS that's out there. I stay away from it. I'm drama free, dude. I don't, I don't, if, if somebody says something on a post that I disagree with, I just shut my mouth and don't let it bother me, you know? I yeah. Don't. I try to stay away from all that. Um, as far as the state of the hobby, I think overall there's a lot of good. Um, there, there's a lot, a lot of good. There's a lot of people doing a lot of really cool stuff. You know, some of the some of the guys I've met in this hobby have become my best friends in and out of the hobby. You know, there's yep. a lot of guys I go to for advice, just about actual life stuff, not just reptiles. You know, and there's a lot of really, really good people, dude. And, um, but there's always, there's always bad with good and that's with anything in life and you can't let the bad take over. You know, you can't let it, you can't let it control you. You can't let it bother you, you know, because it's, it's out of your control and negative people are going to be negative no matter what you have to say. And yeah. if somebody asks your opinion, you give it honestly. And if they don't like it, okay, you don't got to talk to them. Yeah. You know, don't let it bother you. Don't let, don't lose sleep over it, man. You know, I've always, you know, a, a good buddy of mine has always said, you got to take care of number one and that, and that's you, man. You know, you got to take care of yourself and your, your mental health and your, your outlook on everything. You know, it goes, a, it goes a long way, man, you know? And so there's, there's a lot of good, but there's a lot of bad and you just got to focus on you and focus on what makes you happy. You know, yep. again, that's, that's why I got into cheap, dirt rat snakes you know because they just they made me happy man you know there yeah, wasn't it wasn't cool it wasn't hip it wasn't you know anything but i thought they were amazing and they bring me a lot a lot of joy and well so, that's so what I, that's something i appreciate especially because you know i keep the texas rats too that's that's my one true love with the reptiles yeah. if i had to get rid of every other species and like someone said you had to keep texas rats yeah. for the to your life i'd be totally okay with that yeah that's, 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 and, that's, and listen they're not they're not the best thing in the world i can't sell a snake right now for my damn life on, on morph market but you know yeah. what i don't care because i really like them yeah. um that's the species that got me into everything else so uh guess what i i love it yeah. so and that's uh, all it, it, it would be it would be criminal I, I always say this uh it would be criminal if you're doing this and you don't love the animals or you're doing it for some other goal like money whatever like i think there's a lot of people in the hobby who aren't really passionate about the animals and yeah. that's that's a large part of the problem don't don't keep something because it's popular you know like you will be and i you have will a ton not of enjoy it behind me i have a ton of ball pythons behind <laughs> me i like them yeah, hey, that, that's that's fine, man. You know, ball pythons. I I have a ball python. He's yeah, up there somewhere. You know, he's he's a cool snake. You know, he's the snake that I pull out to put in a kid's hand. You know, he he's fine. He may have been a gag gift from my podcast partner like four years ago, but you know, that's fine, dude. He chills. His name's Spurgeon, and he just hangs out. Nice. And uh, you know, but you gotta you gotta be in the 
work with what you love, man. You know, yeah, don't don't get in don't get into something that's cool, you know, because it's hip right now. Everybody's got these, you know. Do something different. Do something that makes you happy. You know, I, I actually I listened to Sky's episode with you today, and you know, he mentioned about you know about like stepping stones, getting something that's kind of similar to kind of scratch the itch, you know, but I I'm with him, man. You know, you gotta, you gotta know what you're doing. You gotta do your research, but don't get something in place of something else. Cause it's close, you know, it's not, it's not going right. to fulfill you forever. You know, you're going to become stagnant. You know, your care is going to go down, you know, and obviously yep. I don't think your first snake should be a, you know, a, a Jansen eye, you know, that it's just a, it's a bad idea. It's a pretty advanced snake, you know, but yeah, if that, if that's what it is and that's like, that's the only snake I want. Talk to a lot of people, do a ton of research and know what you're getting into. And I'm sure you can make it happen. You know, I know guys who their first snakes were green tree pythons. And a lot of people would say, don't do that. I don't see why not. You know, if you know what you're doing, yeah. you know what you're doing, you know, it's always good to have experience and kind of know, but everybody shifts, you know, everybody kind of starts with something more, you know, easier, you know, those, those starter animals, you know, so everybody kind of starts that way and then cha things change and work up, you know, and technically, if you look at my stuff, most of my collection are those easy starter yep. animals, but they're, they're, it's what I love, you know, they're unique, you know, um, and they're really not, there's not a lot of them, man. There's not, you don't see a ton of locality specific yellow rats in the hobby. No, there's definitely not a lot of them. No. That's for sure. So, but it's what brings me joy and yeah, so I do it. You know? But Awesome. Yeah. And then my, my last and final question, uh, I ask everyone. So like, what would you say to someone who's never kept this group of snakes before, never has had a North American rat snake, um, Maybe they're a Python person that, you know, they've never kept them before. What do you say to someone looking to get into them um, or just jump into a new colubrid species in general? Like, what's your kind of message? Well, it would kind of vary. If somebody's talking like a North American rat snake, I would say don't overthink it. You know, like, don't do this, don't do that. Look at specific parameters because that's the easy thing. It's a good thing about a lot of North American colubrids. There's a lot of different ways you can keep them. You know, my stuff is I keep my room ambient. None of the colubrids in the room have external heat. My room, you know, is a little colder at night, amps up during the day. And that's how I keep every single one of my colubrids from my hognos, my pitcherovis, my nerodia, my pantherovis, barons. They are all, all the same, you know. And then, you know, for stuff a little bit more, advance you know my biggest thing would be do your research and don't be afraid to talk to people you know that that would be honestly my number one piece of advice is actually talk to people working with these things and but you know if you can find somebody breeding them because they're doing something right the google yeah. machine does not always have good answers out there you know there's a lot no, of good information but google's google's one of the worst in my opinion I, yeah. I think talking to people and actually hearing experiences and that's part of what this show is for that that's yeah. why i made this show is for that person that doesn't know uh anything about these species to actually learn something and yeah. to you know put people like you i don't want to say on the map but like put your name out there to someone who you know may want to try this species now they could hit you up on instagram which by the way uh Jake's Instagram will be in the description. So um, go check them out. Give them a follow. And yeah. yeah. And shoot me a message anytime, man. You know, I, I'm very busy a lot, so I may take a little bit to get back to you, but I try to be pretty responsive. And, uh, but dude, message me about any, anything and everything, you know, that's one thing I don't like is when people complain like, oh, this guy was asking me basic questions. Like, oh, this is stuff you can look up online. You know what? They, they asked you. They found you specifically. Yeah, it might be a question they can find in five seconds on Google. But you know what? I'm going to write them a whole freaking paragraph, you know, and give them what I know because I have the experience. And to be honest, I don't know what they're going to find on Google, but I know what works for me. And I know it's worked very well. So I want to share that. I can't stand when people get irritated at somebody new and they're asking, you know, dumb questions. There aren't dumb questions, man. They're new. We all started with these questions. 
Yeah. You know, we all had the same, the same thought process, the same questions, you know, and I found, I was really lucky and I found a lot of people that were very patient with me when I was getting to, into this and I want to be that same exact way. So if you've got any questions about anything that's from the show, anything on my Instagram or what I do, please don't hesitate to ask, you know, I, that's, that's my biggest thing. And, you know, like I said, the, uh, my biggest piece of advice for any, any new species, find somebody working with them, listen to podcasts, you know, about them and just, you know, either listen or talk. You know, read, read and you will learn, you know, listen and you will, you will take up, man. You know, that's, it's those things. And you gotta, you gotta, you gotta take that step, man. You gotta put your foot forward. Sometimes a lot, for a lot of people, it's uncomfortable to talk, you know, to somebody they don't know, but a lot of reptile people are very willing to talk sometimes way too much. <laughs> and that's, it's a wonderful thing about the hobby. You know, there's a few people that aren't about it. And if you find somebody that's like, yeah, go screw yourself. I don't want to talk to you. Find somebody else. You yeah, know, there's going to be more people, you know? Yeah. And, um, yeah. So that's my biggest thing, man. You know, talk to people, listen to podcasts, man. It's a, it's a good outlet. You know, there's a lot of information out there that a lot of people have. And if, if you don't ask, you'll never know. Yep. So. Yeah. All right. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much. It's been a great hour and 50 minutes or so. Um, really appreciate you coming on and talking about this group of species, uh, arguably some of the unloved species in the hobby, but I think they're absolutely amazing and yeah. it's great to talk to people with that passion for them. So again, yeah. really appreciate you, uh, taking some of your time. Um, I know most of you will be watching this on Sunday or sometime throughout the week. Uh, Jake does a podcast on Thursday nights. It's at 9 p.m. EST. Uh, on the uh, so ours, yeah, no, Snakes and Stogies, Snakes and Stogies is live. That's Justin's other podcast. That's at 9 p.m. every Monday. Thursdays we do THP, um, the, the Herpiculture podcast, but that's not live. So it's normally posted gotcha. the, night, the night of or the morning after. Um so but yeah feel free to check that out man you can listen to me ramble even more so all right cool man well um thank you so much again i'm gonna throw you backstage do yeah, the man. outro and we'll talk out after thank you for having me on man i really appreciate it yeah of course all right guys well this was an amazing episode with jake um you know as i said i Appreciated him coming on and talking about these species. Uh, something, you know, really cool. Um, again, another real keeper who's who's big time on passion and stuff he really loves. Um, you know, there's no really other ulterior motive there for him besides the fact that he just loves the species. And I appreciate that so much in this hobby. Um, it's becoming increasingly apparent that not that it's lacking, but I think the hobby could use more of it. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of the end of my message for today. As usual, make sure you hit that like and subscribe to the channel. Uh, check out all my social media below. All of Jake's social media will be in the description of the video. Make sure you go check him out. Give him a follow, send him a message, whatever. Uh, go check me out, uh, Morph Market, Instagram, all that stuff. As always, guys, this has been episode five of the Colubrid Corruption podcast. I appreciate everyone coming out. I hope you have a great rest of your weekend and a fantastic week. Peace out.